This video is about heating curves. I'm going to explain it. There's quite a bit of explanation and then I'm going to work a problem for you. And I picked a grand poopa problem, the, one of the biggest problems that you can have. Um, so a heating curve, you'll recall that um, one of the ways that we have energy changes is with phase changes and heating and warming a substance. That's exactly what we're doing here. In this particular example, example I've graphically displayed how we cool a substance. We're starting um, with 10 grams of water in this gas form, um, all the way at 120 degrees. We're going to cool this, and I'm going to begin labeling as I'm explaining. This first that you see is the gas phase. We're going to cool this gas, and then right here is going to be your evaporation condensation line. So we are going to condense. Now remember, exothermic, endothermic, for this to condense, the gas has to lose energy, give away energy. Gives away the energy, so it cools down, turns into a liquid phase. Um, that's going to be endothermic. If we were going the other way, if we were increasing the temperature, uh, then we put energy into it. Oh, so sorry, I said that wrong. Scratch what I just said. Um, when we condense, give away energy, that's exothermic. If I was going this way and warming up, trying to evaporate from a liquid to a gas, that would need to absorb energy. The water substance would absorb energy. That's the endothermic. Okay, right here we're going to have the liquid. Here is cooling the liquid. And then right here, we are going to um, freeze and melt. I have our stellar custodians changing a light bulb for me. So you'll hear them in the background, so it's great. Um, now right here is where we have our solid. Okay, there's the solid. Now all five of these sections have their very own formula. If you are warming or cooling something, a substance, it gets the Q equals sam delta T. So for the gas, I'm going to put Q sub G for gas equals the specific heat of gas. Now this is important. All the phases have their own specific heat. There are tables that you can look these up. Um, if you weren't using water, maybe you had ethanol, um, you would also be able to look up all of those specific heats for the different phases. So it's going to be C for the gas times the mass times change in temperature. Now for our liquid, this is going to be Q, and I do a subscript L for liquid, equals C of the liquid, specific heat of the liquid, times M delta T, and then solid. This is our Q sub S for solid, equals the specific heat of solid, times mass, times delta T. Now, changing phases. This is where we're going to have heat of vaporization and heat of fusion. So the formula for this, the energy that's absorbed or released, so absorbed when we melt, released when we freeze, Q of, we call it fusion, um, you could do sub F or FUS, sometimes my students will think freezing, um, Q of fusion equals the heat of fusion times, and I wanna point this out, this will be the easy way for you to remember it. Heat of fusion, the unit is joules per gram, so it is mass, that is mass. What's different about this, if you compare heat of fusion to specific heat, is there is no uh, change in temperature. There's no degree C. And that's why this is written as a flat line right there. You guys think so much. Um, now up here, we're going to have Q of vaporization. So that's the energy that's released when we condense or absorbed when we evaporate. That is going to be heat of vaporization times the mass. Now again, significance of there's no Celsius in this because check it out, the temperature doesn't change. It's a flat line, uh, pretty neat. All of the energy um, will go into changing phase before it will, um, it will warm or cool one of the gas, liquid, or solid phases. Um, this is one way I like to think about it. For example, if I was going to melt an ice cube, I start putting energy into the ice cube, all the energy will go into 
changing the phase from a solid to a liquid. The temperature of even the liquid won't increase because the energy goes into changing phase. Um, once all of the molecules have changed phase, then all of the liquid together will begin to um, increase temperature. Now this is if you have everything really close, you know, if you have water that slides far away, then of course that will start to heat up. But for all intent and purpose, when you are melting, evaporating, that is going to stay, stay the same temperature until all the energy is 100% used to 100% change phase. And then that new phase will begin to warm up. Um, okay, so kind of cool, that flat. Another thing I wanna point out, I very purposefully drew the evaporation line bigger than the melting line. Look at this. The um, heat of fusion, it takes 333 joules to melt one gram of ice. Well, look at this. It takes, for heat of vaporization, 2,256 joules to evaporate one gram of liquid. That is almost seven times more. It takes seven times more energy to evaporate than to melt. Why is that? Intermolecular forces. Here, I'm going from a fixed solid to a liquid where the atoms can translate and move, but when we evaporate, not only are these atoms moving, but they 100% completely separate and become gases. So there's no intermolecular forces. It takes a ton of energy to evaporate because we're breaking intermolecular forces. And there's a, a great visual for that. Okay, so our question is, how much energy is released if I take 10 grams of the water at 120 degrees and I cool it all the way down to negative 20 degrees C? To get that total energy, because there are five different formulas here, we're going to have to add them all together. The total energy will be Q of the gas plus Q of vaporization plus Q of liquid plus Q of fusion plus Q of the solid. Wow, we have to do all five of those. Now, you won't always have a problem that's this big. You might melt and then warm up a substance. Um, or you might cool down a liquid, freeze it, and then um, have the temperature go lower than zero degrees. Um, I'm doing the biggest problem possible to give you the best example possible. Okay, so I've written down all of my formulas. Now we can start plugging in. Okay, so let's start with the gas. Q of the gas is specific heat of gas times mass times delta T. Specific heat of gas, I look it up on my table. It is 2.06 joules divided by gram times degree C times the mass, 10 grams. And that's going to stay the same the whole time. Times, okay, change of temperature. Be so, so careful on this. Because that specific heat, that C sub G, only applies to the gas, the change in temperature is only for the gas phase. So the final temperature is 100, and the initial temperature was 120. Now I'm going to tell you to do something that I won't have you do any other place in thermodynamics. I want you to do all of these as absolute value. So if you want, you can come back and add an absolute value to every single one of these. And here's the reason why. Sometimes the signs can get kind of confusing. If you do everything's absolute value, so you always end with a positive, because we're really looking for magnitude change, all right? We just want the change of energy, the amount of energy that's released, or if it's going the other way, amount of energy absorbed, don't care. I'm looking for a change of energy right now. Do all those apps as absolute value, and then what we do is we add up all of these changes of energy for phase changes, cooling the phases, and at the very end, we are going to add a sign, positive if it was endothermic, negative if it was exothermic, and that shows the direction, but we don't do that until the very, very end. So do all these as absolute value, because you can see if I did this right here, I'd end up with a negative, and you'll see in the next equation, it won't be negative. So you'd end up adding and subtracting, 
and that will give us total magnitude change. Okay, so let's plug this in. 2.06 times 10 times 20. That is going to give us, I have to make sure you can see that, yep, um, 412. So if you look at all the units, this is degree C, it's in joules. Energy released when we pull down the gas. Now let's do our Q of vaporization. This is going to be heat of vaporization. I look on my table, 2256 joules per gram times my 10 grams. Okay, now notice on this, grams cancel, we'll end with joules. That's why there's no delta T in this. Um, and notice if I multiply this, I get a positive number. So you can see where the problem would start to come if I had left this a negative. So do absolute values. We are going to get 22560. Let's do Q of liquid, 4.184 joules, grams times degree C times mass, 10 grams. Okay, again, be careful on the temperature. Final temperature for liquid, look at it. Right there, the liquid ends at the zero degrees. So final temperature is zero degrees minus the initial temperature of the liquid, 100 degrees. Uh, and let's do this. I guess they were all tens and hundreds, one hundreds. I could have probably done that way in my head. 4184. And that's also joules. Okay, good. Now we're going to do Q of fusion. So this is going to be our freezing. Uh, heat of fusion, again, look at my table. There it is. 333 joules per gram times my 10 grams. That is going to give us 3330 joules that will be released when it freezes. And then our last one, is going to be Q of the solid right here. So Q of S, specific heat of the solid is 1.86 joules by grams times degree C times our 10 grams times, okay, careful with that temperature again. We can only look where the C sub S, the specific heat of the solid is, right down here. Final temperature, negative 20 minus the initial temperature of zero. And again, I'm going to do an absolute value on that. So we are going to have 100 times 1.86, which gives us 372. Now, I can take one, two, three, four, five of those Q values. So it's the energy released at each of the five steps, and that will give us Q total. So again, I did absolute value on all of these. I'm just going to take our numbers and add them up. We will get, let's see here. I got 30,858 joules. And then I think direction that the energy is moving so we're going from really hot gas down to the um, solid ice. This substance has to cool down. It releases its energy, gives away its energy. That means this is exothermic. So this is going to be a negative sign right there. 30,858 joules are released if you cool 10 grams of water from 120 degrees all the way down to negative 20 degrees C. Now some of the important things, um, draw the graph. So important, draw the graph. Do everything as absolute value, and at the end, you add the sign. Be so, so careful on your change of temperature. Um, so when you do the change of temperature, you have to look for just that phase right there. Um, I do wanna show you quickly if you're given something that's not as big as this problem. Let's say that it tells you you're going to melt a solid and you're going to warm it up to 30 degrees. This is how I would draw the heating curve. You're going to melt. Okay, so there's my straight line for a phase change melting. And we're going to warm it up to 30 degrees. So there's your zero degrees C, warm it to 30. 
And then I add to it my formulas. Um, Q of fusion is heat of fusion times mass. Q of the liquid, warming up that liquid. C of liquid, mass, delta T. Then to get total energy that's absorbed to melt and warm this, Q total is going to be Q liquid plus Q fusion. And then I would just do my plug and chug. Absolute values, and at the very end I'm thinking, this is absorbing energy, I put a plus sign, a positive sign for endothermic at the very end. So make sure that you draw is worth it. Draw the heating curve, add the formulas, do absolute value, and be really careful on that delta T. You should be good to go. Good luck, have fun.